Yo, yo, yo. Hey, guys, welcome back to another awesome edition of the Best Practices Show podcast. My name is Kirk Barron. My job is to bring you the best educators in the entire dental world and bring you some great information to help you improve your practice and your life. And today we do exactly that with a good friend of mine, Dr. Drew McDonald. And today we go down the path of surgically facilitated orthodontic treatment. And there's been a lot of news about some recent stuff that's happened. And so Drew shares his thoughts and gives us some clarity on how this can add great value to your practice. So listen up. I know you guys enjoy it. And we'll see you soon. Hey guys, welcome back to the Best Practices Show podcast. You know the jam around here. I just find the smartest, coolest people in the world, and we talk about the issues that matter in dentistry. We're going to do exactly that with my friend Drew McDonald on, and we're going to be talking about surgically facilitated orthodontic treatment, S-F-O-T. Drew, how are you, brother? I'm doing great. It's always good to be here with you. Dude, you're the best. I just really appreciate you. You're like a rock star coming on into the scene you know, one of these days I'm going to hang out with you and that way I can just get into these, you know, special places, <laughs> VIP rooms and all that kind of stuff. But, uh, uh, I just, I'm a big fan of yours. You've been on the show so many times and, uh, I always like to start here just because there's so many people listening and a lot of young listeners, uh, give us a little background. Who is Drew McDonald and what do you do? Yeah. So I'm going to lead in a little differently than I have in the past, which is that I am a dentist who didn't get into dental school the first time that I applied. Um, I know for anybody young and listening, that's, that's a thing. I mean, I, it's a very competitive place. I have a lot of people that shadow at my office. Uh, I'm an orthodontist, by the way, I didn't clarify that. Mm -hmm. Um, but at my orthodontic office, I have a lot of pre-dental students shadow. Some end up working at our office and every year it comes around that we have to apply and take our DAT. And I know that we've had been around a lot of very talented, very smart kids. And I just, I wasn't even one of those because they always tell me their DAT scores and I go, wow, I was nowhere close to that. And so, you know, at the end of the day, what I want to say is if you're out there and you're applying to dental school and you don't get in the first time, make sure that you try again, because if it's something you love and if it's something you want to do, it's worth it to, to spend another year or even two to, to accomplish it. Because at the back end, being a dentist, being an orthodontist, it is a very rewarding career. Yeah. And again, it's something that if you can devote that time and that effort and you know it's what you want, it's worth it to, to apply and apply again. And again, yeah. I, I, I had a tough time after I didn't get in the first time because I was pretty down. And you know I thought, hey, I've done everything right. But it made me that much more appreciative of the opportunity. And ultimately, when I did get in, I said, I don't want to waste this because I know how hard I had to work to get this opportunity. And I think, honestly, it changed who I was as a person because I became that much more driven to apply myself in a world uh, that I wasn't, you know, that I knew I wanted to be the best at that I could be. But I knew it that much more the second year because I did not get in the first time. Yeah. I don't think you've shared that story. So that's a, yeah, that is definitely a new, a new one. <laughs> I like it. Yeah, yeah. I like I told it. the baseball story enough. I was, I was sitting there going, what's a new one today. I got to tell something good. So no, that's great. I really appreciate that though. You know, more than anything, because I don't know, Pete Dawson said this years ago and I'll never forget. He's like, don't think that anyone just gets there. It takes seven years of hard work to be an overnight success at anything. And I didn't like hearing that because that's too long of a time frame. But you see people that have just really, they've got this grit that, and, you know, and I've shared this before. In the, I flunked out of college twice and it wasn't, you know, it, it, I just had too much fun. And then I was like, okay. And my wife is always like, don't share that with people. And I'm like, no, it's true. Like I had my, my parents had no money. So I'm not putting myself in the same, you know, ring as you. Cause I think you're way smarter, but like, there's, there's something to be said for just staying focused and working hard. So, yeah, it's, 
Well, and I, I tell this to all the kids that come through, I, I shouldn't say kids, all the pre-dental students that come through my office. I say, no one is born a great dentist. You yeah. don't know rolling out of the, the crib how to do a class two prep or how to put orthodontic brackets on. It's, it's the work. And if you show up and you work hard and you have good discipline, good things happen. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's something that, you know, it's changed the way, like I said, I live my life, the way that I practice, uh, because I had to learn that discipline and to go get it the second time. So. Yeah. Now I'm obviously I'm a big fan of yours. You're a humble guy. You're not just an orthodontist. You're an incredible educator and you think differently. And so as you listen to this podcast today, you're going to hear some different thinking. And I want to start here. Let's, let's talk about the why. So we're going to be talking about, you know, surgically facilitated orthodontic treatment. Can you explain what that is and the why and why it's so important even this week talking about this? Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the reasons I picked this topic is because there's a lot of controversy going on right now, um, especially because of the CBS news story that came out about the AGA appliance, which is an anterior growth guidance appliance. Uh, really, it's an orthodontic appliance that's trying to move teeth. But what was happening to these cases that are being shown on TV is that the patient's bone levels in terms of their alveolar bone uh, was very likely not assessed before that patient got into treatment. And so what happens is you can only move teeth so far because there's an envelope of bone around the roots that kind of keeps the, the teeth stable. And if you push those teeth beyond what the capacity of that bone uh, has to handle that, then you can push teeth right out of bone. You can expose roots. You can cause teeth to die. You can cause severe recession. And I can't tell you how many times I see adult patients in my office that have been through some sort of orthodontic treatment in their life. Uh, and a lot of times they have significant bone issues where you're trying to move teeth and that bone is thinner and you're at a high risk getting into this orthodontic case if you try and move those teeth in that thinner bone. And so back to what surgically facilitated orthodontics is, is that we can utilize our periodontist colleagues a lot in these situations. And if we're able to diagnose that patient's bone conditions or their alveolar phenotype is the fancy word for that, um, before we start our orthodontic treatment, a lot of times these patients, we can work together with our periodontists to do bone grafting or soft tissue grafting along with the orthodontic tooth movement. And what ends up is a, a much more stable result. We're preventing things like recession from happening along the way. And one of the other big benefits is that you know, teeth move about 50% of the, the, uh, the pace faster than they would without doing or utilizing the surgical techniques. And so a lot of times patients, especially adult patients who really don't want to be in treatment very long, uh, this becomes a bonus for them because they get in and out of treatment faster. And again, they're happy because they're not having unforeseen recession. They're not having trouble with their teeth. They're not having loose teeth that are about to fall out at the end of treatment. But it really all comes back to we need to be diagnosing at a higher level before we get into these orthodontic cases. And that involves uh, as a minimum standard of care in orthodontics, utilizing a CBCT. Yeah. And that is 100 percent where the profession needs to go. Yeah. So let's I'll just play the role of a young dentist coming out. Drew, give me some give me an idea where we are in the map here when you talk about bone conditions and. I already know when I get out of dental school, like there's so many camps on this. What do you need? What do I need to know before I start engaging in this conversation and talking to patients about this? Yeah. So one of the first things, uh, and this is a, a doctor who changed the way that I think about orthodontics. His name is Dr. George Mandelaris. He is a periodontist in Chicago. Um, he and I started talking a few years ago because he was putting out a or he had been in the works and it's just about to be released this spring in 2023 uh, a book called surgically facilitated orthodontic treatment and him and dr brian vince from chicago uh, are two of the most talented dentists that i know uh, periodontist and dentist restorative that basically have been executing this type of plan for years and i know that i was doing it in my neck of the woods in albuquerque for a few years before george and i started talking but really what changed my mind was that George and Brian had put together kind of a little workflow that simplifies the diagnostic process where if you take a 3D x-ray or, or cone beam CT, and if you're able, what it allows you to do is visualize, you know, the crestal bone, which is the part that's closest to the crown, 
and also the bone around the, the root portion of the tooth. And if that bone is less than one millimeter, which means you're not able to see it on a CBCT, then that's a high risk situation. And so whenever you start diagnosing cases of ortho, there's really three or four regions that are very important that you need to look at. One of which is the upper anterior bone around the front teeth. Why would that be important? Well, if you're going to move those teeth and flare them or retract them or whatever tooth movement that you're going to do, it's a good idea to know if there's adequate bone to handle that type of movement. Uh, on the other side, in the lower anterior, that is the highest frequency area to have thin bone. And we know from certain types of growth patterns, especially people with jaw joint issues, that they have thinner bone in the lower anterior a lot of times uh, or open bite cases. And so if you're trying to correct that bite issue and we don't have great bone, we're asking for trouble. And so again, those are two of the most important areas. The other areas that are, that are, are very important are in the back, uh, our posterior teeth, because especially in today's world where we're doing a lot of expansion and trying to help expand the maxilla for breathing issues and all of that, if we're doing an expander that bases off of the teeth, and you know, has the potential to tip those teeth or push those teeth out, then we need to know, does that bone in that area have enough thickness to handle that movement as well? And also, if we're gonna expand the, the maxilla, the mandible has to go with it and we have to upright those lower teeth. And if we don't have great bone around those lower back teeth to upright into, we're gonna see a ton of recession and very likely we're gonna see an unstable result. And so back to pre-orthodontic treatment planning, we have to, at minimum, see that bone. And you cannot see that bone on a pano. You cannot see it on a lateral ceph, which is traditionally what orthodontists have worked with, which is two-dimensional imaging. We have to dive into the 3D imaging world to actually diagnose these conditions. And so, you know, to kind of take it one step further, you know, traditionally in ortho, we've thought of utilizing periodontists and all this, you know, surgically facilitated techniques as maybe a little bit of overkill because, oh my gosh, we're asking a patient to go do this surgery along with orthodontics. And if all we were telling them was that it might speed up your treatment, which we've known that for a long time, that's been since the eighties with the Wilco brothers, um, Dr. Frost, who had also, you know, kind of pioneered that in general, that was our only excuse to get someone to go to a periodontist back in the day. And so a lot of patients would go, eh, I don't really care that much about that. And what would end up happening is that we'd see recession when we thought we weren't going to. So again, the, this is where the 3D world and CBCTs have changed how we execute plans is it allows us to see the enemy before we get in on the treatment plan. We have, if we see that bone has areas of concern, then we should get them to our periodontist before treatment so that they understand, hey, if I do this procedure, I'm going to have less likelihood of, you know, having recession and problems later. And so, you know, that's really where the 3D world is changing the way that we interdisciplinarily work together, if that's a word, sorry. Um, but essentially, it opens up our world. And if our patients see they've got that thinner bone, a lot of times they ask me, okay, what do I do? Because I don't want that recession. I don't want problems with my teeth. I can see how thin that bone is. And that's where, again, it you know, opens up the conversation that you need more involved treatment and patients say yes to that more involved treatment. Yeah. So can I throw in two, two things that come to mind? Because I'm totally picking up what you're putting down. But let me throw two elephants in the room. It's the, the 3D world. You know, it's a big conversation. But even the best mm -hmm. minds say only a certain percentage of people are really embracing and doing the 3D world. True or false? True especially in orthodontics, unfortunately, um, you know, the, 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 I think we've talked a little bit about this in the past and I did a masterclass on how important it is to diagnose with CBCT and MRI in the orthodontic world. And, you know, a lot of times, again, not to get too controversial, but what happens is that a lot of the older guard in, in any profession, not just ortho, but they say, Hey, we've always done it with this set of imaging. Why do we have to move into this? And oh, by the way, there's so much fear about a 3D image, possibly adding more radiation to the, the patient and saying, oh, we need to scale 3D, you know, and they, they base a lot of uh, decisions on old material. And what I mean by that is that today's 3D x-ray machines, cone beam CTs 
are, you know, when we do a, a light scan on an orthodontic patient, we're doing less radiation in one 3D image than we are from a panoramic X-ray and a Ceph X-ray, which are two dimensional images. And so again, if you're going to sit there and say a 3D is overkill because of radiation purposes, I think that that argument is by the wayside at this point. Uh, mm -hmm. Again, that's based off of old, you know, CT images, which are heavy radiation. Cone beam CT is much different. And so we have to start changing that narrative that we're, that we're doing, that we're over irradiating our patients um, when we have these newer tools to be able to really have a much better radiation level for them than, than what our old images even used to pr provide. Yeah. Um, and yeah, have you ever heard this? Note, oh, Drew, have you ever go heard ahead. this? The seven most expensive words in business? That's the no, way we've always me. done it. <laughs> no, that's yeah, the way we've always exactly. done it. And that's, that's, that's a big, I cut you off. You were getting ready to say something, but oh, I, no. yeah. That's the, anyway, the, the way we've always done it needs change. <laughs> yeah. And again, it's, it opens up so much more because Here's the reality, and I know in the past I've done podcasts about TMJ and airway-directed orthodontics. You can't see joints or airway issues on patients without a 3D either in right. a lot of these cases. Uh, and I should clarify that airway issues, especially pharyngeal airway issues, again, they're visualized. They're not diagnosed on an x-ray. Uh, the x-ray is a helpful tool. However, you know, again, back to what our world as orthodontics really needs to be is so much more than teeth. Yeah. Because what puts a patient in our chair uh, and creates malocclusions are airway issues, tongue issues, TMJ issues. And to execute how we correct those, we have to see all of these things. Otherwise, if we overlook them diagnostically, they're going to come back to haunt us. And what's dead will never die. And we are going to be chasing and chasing a malocclusion because we didn't get to the root of the problem. Yeah. So we can only see that with imaging. And 2D imaging is not enough anymore. Yeah. So can I ask you this too? Again, I love it. And as you guys have already seen, I mean, Drew's a thinker and you are, it's so fun to listen to you and how you collaborate with everybody else. And, you know, if I'm a young dentist listening, okay, I'm going to just throw the second elephant in the room. Okay. Orthodontist and periodontist playing together. Okay. So help me with that. I can't even get them together to communicate, you know, in, in the smallest fashion, You've got to be into the long tail of this, right? And and building a, a team. Help me with some thought processes on how I put that team together. Yeah. So, so I mean, everybody, uh, at least when we come out of ortho school, we know that there are certain things that we don't want to stress with tooth movement. One of those is if we have thin tissue, that was always the 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 traditional thought is oh look at the gum tissue don't in because we could see it at the surface it's right there in front of us and so a lot of times there's adult patients and it's been well established the the you know a patient needs to be periodontally stable before going into orthodontics um, i don't know that everybody who starts orthodontic cases observes that sometimes because i've seen a lot of problems <laughs> after ortho that, that come up um, but in general, that is always, I think every orthodontist and every periodontist who are out there kind of understand in common that, that there's a risk for periodontal issues when you get into ortho. But we've always looked at it as, is there already recession or is the gum tissue thin? What we need to wrap our heads around again is where's the bone? And I know I'd said that earlier, but, you know, so back to playing together, um, this is again where the imaging facilitates conversations. And I show, pay, you know, basically in my world, we do our diagnostics with our CBCT, uh, you know, MRI, whatever else we do. But with that, I put together a whole presentation that shows those levels of bone to the patient. And then with my referral to the periodontist, uh, it has those same pictures of that CBCT. And then we just send, you know, that's, you know, the image so they can scroll through too and see what they need to see. The other thing I do is that I utilize treatment simulation software, um, you know, that allows us to visualize one, the bone two, if I move these teeth in this fashion, what does that bone look like? If in around the roots, did I move the root out of the bone? Uh, if I tried to accomplish that, and there are some softwares that are helpful again for visualizing that one of which, um, oh my gosh, I'm blanking on it. I'll get it in a minute. But there's multiple different types of software at this moment that you can simulate tooth movement in 
Um, one is sure smile. There it is. I figured it out. Mm -hmm. Uh, the newer Invisalign technology also shows you bone levels. And again, we can't just assume that if we move teeth, the bone will follow. These are helpful tools that, that can simulate, okay, there's thinner bone already. The root's going to, we're trying to do this. We're, we might have some issues there. Back to communication with the periodontist, that is where we send you basically that simulation as well and say, this is what I'm trying to do. I'm, I'm going to need some bone in these areas to facilitate that movement. And also if you do, you know, basically, so I have a very detailed referral that goes with uh, each patient with images and everything else saying, this is what we need to accomplish. These are my areas of concern. So back to finding somebody who will actually do that. I was very lucky that, you know, in, in Albuquerque, there, there was a Dr. Kim Crook who recently retired and the other doctor who I work with all the time, Curtis Pino, um, they had trained really well on, on doing this type of procedure. And that is something just like everywhere else in dentistry, not everybody loves certain procedures and wants to do them. So as an orthodontist, if you're out there hearing this, you know who your periodontists are in your area of town. And you can say, Hey, if I'm seeing these issues and I'm taking CBCTs, are you comfortable with performing this type of procedure, the, the surgically facilitated bone grafting or soft tissue grafting? or even just some cuts in the bone that help the teeth move faster. And so you can approach your periodontal colleagues and say, is this something that you feel comfortable doing? Because the real thing is that there, again, there's publications in terms of the book that Dr. Mandelaris is, uh, and Dr. Bensay are putting out. There's a ton of research dating back to the eighties on all of these procedures and the techniques get better and better over time or have gotten better and better. So I think it's a, a very useful or a very, approachable conversation that an orthodontist and periodontist in your city can all have. And I don't think that it's too far above anybody to, to say, let's work together and do this because it's not that far out of the scope for either ortho or perio. It's just, how are we going to accomplish this together? And that's where the imaging, the treatment uh, simulation technology say, what do we really need? And it yeah. helps all parties know how to execute. Yeah. And so if you're a young dentist listening, you might be thinking, why? Why would I care about this? Well, the truth of it is, is it's not, it's an issue that's not going away. Would you agree? And so talking to Tracy, when you guys are both rock stars, anybody I have interviewed on this subject, they are crazy busy, like insanely busy of people that want to breathe better. They want to figure out what's going on. So Drew, can you speak to that? If I'm a dentist listening and I'm like, I, if I go down this path, I'm passionate about it. I don't think anyone will come and see me. Can you dispel that rumor? Oh yeah. You'll be busier than you ever want it to be. <laughs> Why? Why? It's, uh, no, it's so back to, I mean, we're talking a little bit about airway directed treatment and you know, we know it, the tide is here and it's, it's crested in terms of the evidence we have that certain types of orthodontic procedures do help us breathe better, especially through our nose. Um, maxillary expansion, whether it's for a three-year-old with a toothpaste expander or something that's, you know, easier to expand because the kiddo is super pliable. And I, I always use the analogy, they're, they're like a ball of Play-Doh. We can mold them so easily at those ages. But as you get older, you know, the patients become uh, harder to expand with, with tooth, uh, tooth borne expanders. And again, if we're trying to achieve expansion to open up nasal passages and help give our tongue better space to operate and all of that, um, it's really important that we know what we're working with, with the bone around those teeth, especially as a patient gets older. You know, uh, in, in my office, I, you know, we do a lot of uh, MSE or MARPEAT style of expansion on adults. And I actually cut the arms off so that it's not pushing on teeth because I don't want any chance of tipping those teeth, especially if I saw on their pre op or their pre uh, treatment images that they had thinner bone. And so again, if we're trying to achieve an, a, an orthodontic and an airway directed plan, that's trying to help somebody breathe better, sleep better, all of the above, then it's really important. We understand what we're working with now back to the controversy of today you know, a couple weeks ago and really uh, apparent is the, the AGA device again, because a lot of people, especially, uh, you know, who are wanting to expand, there's tons of types of expanders out there. And, you know, there's MSC, Marpy, and, and, and AGAs and ALFs and all of these things. The most important thing that we 
need to understand, no matter what type of expander we have, is what is the foundation of the alveolar bone? Because that's where people can get in trouble. And that's what happened with this AGA situation is that with the best intentions, some doctors say, hey, I want to expand. I want those teeth to be out here because it's going to open up space for the tongue. And we're going to be able to give this patient a better life. And going into that treatment again with with the intentions of helping from a bigger picture i commend everyone who looks at treatment dentally orthodontically that way because our world is so much bigger than teeth but back to understanding the teeth component and the bone component if you go in and just expand everybody without assessing things properly there can be trouble on the back end of that situation and that's exactly again what happened with the aga is that if we're trying to tip those front teeth out or push the anterior part of the maxilla forward and widen at the same time, there are biologic limits to that. And one, especially uh, obviously is the bone. And if, if we don't see that bone level, we can ask for trouble, which is what happened where people were tipping teeth out of bone, causing severe recession, causing people to lose teeth and, you know, have a much bigger dental problem than what they came into the treatment plan with. So I can't stress this enough. Seeing before we get into cases, we'll save our butts on the back end of things. Yeah. So I want to piggyback on that. I want you to go back to that. So just at the bar talking to everybody, this is a hot, hot subject. And so many of your friends and mine, I won't mention their names, are like, you know, everybody could be a little bit better if they just slowed down. One of the words that doesn't come up a lot is patience. Like as a clinician, two things. Can you speak on this? You don't have to figure all of this out. You don't have to be at Drew McDonald's level to start all. You can actually start. But the second piece is being patient enough to make sure that we're doing the right thing before we move to the next phase. Because again, this we, we can open that up to other treatment modalities, but so many people are in so much of a hurry to get this treatment done. Uh, patients and clinicians. Can you speak to that? Yeah. And especially in ortho, I, it's, it's puzzled me the last, the more that I've been in this world of how I practice now, which is slowing down, like you said, taking records, taking time between the first time I meet that patient and when we go over their treatment, because I need to analyze these things. Um, in ortho and especially coming out of orthodontic residency, they're there are certain types of models of practice that seem to be getting pushed upon us. And I say that because as an orthodontist, we want to do the best for our patients, no matter what. Uh, There are some outside forces in orthodontics, such as corporate dentistry, other things. And I won't throw that to the, you know, in there too much, but when you come out of residency, you need a job. Mm -hmm. And when you uh, need a job, sometimes the people who are operating that job, might have a practice model that pushes something of what we call an orthodontic same day starts of treatment. And so what that means is that as the orthodontist, the first time you meet that patient, you are expected to look at photos and a two, usually a 2D x-ray, sometimes a 3D if you're lucky in one of those settings. But essentially you're expected to look at a pano, a lateral ceph, and some pictures and have the entire diagnosis right then tell that patient and their parents the treatment plan that you're thinking and then oh by the way they're supposed to start treatment that day because the business side really likes that model because it's a start it's money in our pockets it's it's booming right we're we did this many today and again not to throw too much shade but there are facebook groups where people and offices brag on we did 28 same day starts today and we're competing with this other office for this and what that means to me is same day shit so mm-hmm. anyway, I, I mean that in a nice way. Sorry there, Kurt. I can't get out of these without cussing one. Hey, that's okay. The network <laughs> won't censor us. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no worries. But essentially, where, where I get passionate about this is that this is the prop. These are the cases that you get yeah. into trouble with. And because you, you cannot be expected in that short of a time to analyze airway, bone, uh, have a CBCT that you've ran through, seen everything, And most importantly, back to CBCTs or any other imaging, when you have a high level image that's showing a lot of stuff, you need a radiologist to read that. And they can't read those in 30 seconds. They they need some time. And so, you know, even the best, and I work with uh, Chris Matisse, who is at DI Diagnostics. I would highly recommend him for radiologists um, if you're looking for something other than beam readers and, you know, 
not nothing against beam readers. I used them forever. I had a great one, but my, my guy retired. Um, in general though, essentially back to it from the first time you meet that patient to when you should be, or when you're offering treatment options to actually be able to offer them options and say what's under the surface was, is there an airway issue we have to be part of? Are there joint issues that are part of this? We need time. Yeah. And I think that what we need to do is feel comfortable stepping back and saying, Hey, you know, at that new patient exam, these are the issues I'm seeing. I need these images and this diagnostic criteria or these materials for me to adequately assess and make recommendation. Yeah. And ultimately what I've seen is that patients value that they love it because they're like, okay, that's not what I heard down the street at that other place where they were trying to get me to go start treatment and take $500 off if I did it right now, you know, kind of thing. Yeah. But, but that is a model. And so back to doing quality care, it's possible. And patients don't, they're not going to run away from that. They actually want it. Right. And that's what I had to mentally get over at first was coming out of school. It's a business. I've got to start X amount of patients. I've got to make money. I've got my, my bills. I've got life, you know, and what I've seen is that by taking a step back and doing things differently and being higher quality, you can have a more independent style of practice where you can, uh, like I said, charge more, um, <clears throat> see less patients and have a better quality of life along with that. And ultimately, you know, do better for your patients. And I can't tell you how many patients that come in orthodontically with crowding and, or, you know, a, a bite that's way off and we discover an, a, an airway issue, especially, or a jaw joint issue, especially where, you know, we go, okay, well, we did something bigger for this patient and their life quality is going to be better because we are able to help those things or get them better. Um, and again, I can't think enough. I have to thank the people who taught me to think that way, which are Jeff Rouse, Dr. Jim McKee, and of course, Dr. Mark Piper, yeah. who are huge people in my life who've taught me and they're not orthodontists. I say this every time they are not orthodontists. We as orthodontists do not have to only offer our world to other orthodontists when we're looking at advice. Yeah. And again, I, I can't thank those guys enough, especially Dr. Mark Piper. He kind of changed, he flipped my whole world upside down. Um, and so did every, everybody else I mentioned, but I, you have to fight your way back through it to do good things. Yeah. Amen, brother. So well said. I have so many more questions and I know you, you're doing this on your day off and you've got your kids coming home and all that. We're going to, we're going to save it for another episode, but I want you to mention a couple things. I want to mention what you're up to and, uh, your study club and all that. But before we do that, um, any last thoughts that you would love for people to consider when it comes to SFOT and the future? Yes, absolutely. The, um, the biggest thing, um, so there's a couple things coming out. One is if you, if you have the opportunity, when this book is released, I think it will be April of this year. George Mandelaris, Brian Bensay's textbook is gold. It has so many great authors. Some of the people I mentioned earlier, um, I did author a chapter as well in this book. I have no financial thing in this. I just, I thought that this would be a great, uh, this is something I'm passionate about. So yes, of course I'm going to contribute. But that book and, and also the works of Dr. George Mandelaris that he's done in the past for the periodontal profession um, are huge. And again, there's so many other periodontists that I'm, uh, that I'm, min I'm, miss I'm not mentioning here, um, not, not on purpose, but just who have also paved the way for this type of conversation between ortho and perio. Right. And so, you know, back to it, that book, I would pick it up or purchase the chapters online individually, whatever you think is best but this this is the new world and especially when we have an opportunity to change the standard of care because we know more because we have new technologies we have to do it we yeah. can't hide in the past with our two-dimensional images so again embrace the new that's kind of my other message is you know with orthodontics we are evolving and again it's the the wave is here on the airway front on the tongue front on the perio side on the joints all of the things that we know very well have that, that contribute to malocclusions and why that patient's in our chair, we can't hide from them anymore. We can't just hide on a, on a 2D Ceph or Pano. We have to be better diagnosticians. And quite honestly, our world is hard. Orthodontics is hard because we have to be good at joints, airway, tongue ties, uh, perio. We have to know these things. Yeah. Whereas in the past, we maybe didn't think we had to. 
So again, it, it just opens up our orthodontic world and our dental world whenever we know that we can be part of these types of cases in new ways. And again, I think that we as orthodontists, as dentists in general, we need to embrace the, this part of, of our future, which is being bigger than teeth. Yeah. And I think we're going there and we're going to be great at it. And the more time we have, the even better we'll do for patients. Yeah. Well, buddy, we're so proud of you. I mean, I truly think you're changing the world. You're changing the way people think. And I know you're making people's lives better. And Bill Robbins doesn't like it when I say this, nor does Jeff Rouse. The, the number one requested masterclass of all time we've ever done is yours. You know, people, what? I get no so, way. no, what? I'm not kidding. Every week <laughs> no I way. get, if you guys are listening, Drew did two of them. He did uh, TMD directed orthodontics. Uh, for us. And then you did another one. Uh, and I have both of them actually templated in an email right now. Cause I just got tired of trying to find them. <laughs> so <laughs> if you send an email to me at Kirk at actdental.com, I'll send you a copy of his two previous masterclasses. You'll love them. You're going to want to share them with everybody. And if anything, you'll see just somebody who thinks really well about what's best for patients, buddy. I'm so excited to see what you do in the future. Um, I want people that are listening to if they don't know who you are, a couple things. Number one, I want them to follow you. So if I want to find out more about what you're doing. Number two, if I have a study club and I haven't had you speak to my study club, what the heck am I thinking? And number three, I want you to mention your study club that you have with McKee and Ringhofer and those guys. Can you mention all three of those? Yeah, I think I'll, I wrote down some notes there. <laughs> um, no, that's so, so big, you know, the places that, that you can find me, I, I do a lot of speaking, uh, like I'll do full day programs. I'll do, uh, but basically on these these areas, which is joints, airway, perio, it's it's every orthodontic case. So um, I do a lot of, of speaking around the country and, and all that regarding this. Um, I think the show notes will have how to contact me if you're interested. Um, back to one of the things I'm really excited and proud about, and there's a couple other guys that, that you've interviewed uh, on here. So Dr. Jim McKee, uh, Dr. Kurt Ringhofer, and another Dr. Uh, Seth Atkins, who's in Dallas. Uh, the four of us have what we call, or what we call the Chicago study club, which we meet twice a year. Um, you know, it's a, it's a joint and airway based progressive occlusion. Uh, you know, Dr. Ringhofer, Dr. Uh, McKee and, and Seth Atkins are all restorative dentists. And then for some reason they invited me as the orthodontist to come along and, and do something fun. But, but in general, we're, we're pushing the envelope on what we know about joints and airway and how do you restore occlusions? How do you restore bites? How do you orthodontically execute plans when you have these patients? Mm -hmm. So again, that's been a huge, uh, very fun project that we're doing together and we're expanding the groups. We had one group that was to capacity. We have a little waiting list for the second group, but I think we're going to open that up soon. Um, so that's really exciting. And then for, I, I have to give one other plug and this is kind of a new project that, uh, Dr. Courtney Levine, uh, who is a world-renowned cosmetic dentist. And then she went to the dark side and became an orthodontist. So um, her and I, yeah, that's that's an incredible journey for someone who went uh, AACD, uh, you know, the youngest I think ever, to then say, I'm going to go back and be an orthodontist. Um, she's amazing. She's an airway focus, you know, TMJ, all the stuff we're talking about. Her and I are actually starting a continuum of classes for orthodontics and restorative dentists. And that should be opening up here this fall uh, and into next year. So very excited about that project. That's more of an ortho specific or ortho restorative specific. Um, but ultimately that's going to be pumping up for next year. So yeah. very excited. I'm so pumped. So if you guys are listening and you're not taking notes, don't worry. We're taking notes for you. So if you flip up to the notes, you're going to see, like Drew mentioned, all of his contact information and for his study club. I don't like the name of your study club. There's got to be a better name than to the <laughs> Chicago Study Club. And I actually know when you guys are meeting next because it's on my birthday, March 31st, and you have the great Bill Robbins coming. That's going to be we amazing. Do. Yeah. Yeah. I'll have to rub it in his face. I'm just kidding. No, I won't. Yeah, you'll have to. <laughs> no. no, you'll have to. And I'm going to leave the listeners hanging. He came here last summer and presented the most difficult case he's ever done of all time. And the woman cut it off at night. Have you heard this one? Oh, no, I haven't. She cut it off with a miter saw at home. Now, <laughs> I'm not going to share any more details than that, but you're going to see one of the greatest restorative dentists of all time take you through the most difficult case of all time. 
Drew, I was in a full sweat. I was sweating profusely when he was explaining. And I'm like, this guy's a genius. And it just goes to show nothing. I I mean, nothing surprises me anymore. So it's just pretty. So ask him to share that case. And actually, I'm going to have him come on the show and share that. But uh, you guys are going to have a great time. I'll also put links once you get them to us, Drew, for the, um, the group you're doing with Courtney. I think that would be amazing for any of the listeners. And I'm just telling you, at the very least, just follow what Drew's doing. If you go to a conference and he's speaking, squeeze in the door like, and just get a little bit of it by osmosis. I'm telling you, it's great stuff. So, Drew, as always, I'm super grateful to have you on. So thank you, brother, for being on. Yeah, thanks again, Kirk. Always a pleasure. Yeah, stick around. We say goodbye to everybody else, but thank you guys for listening to the Best Practices Show. Hey, if you enjoyed today, which I know you did, just do us a favor, hit the share button, share this with your friends because this is just so much fun. I love CE so much, and I love this profession. I'm going to continue to find rock stars like Drew and just, you know, hopefully add a little value to your drive, whether you're cutting the grass or cleaning the garage. You guys always tell me you like either cleaning the garage, cutting the grass or on a drive. So it's fun stuff. So keep listening or keep watching the best practices show. And we'll see you guys soon.